Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through full food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week, I'm going fishing with Jenny Jeffries. It's the most dangerous peacetime occupation there is. They literally go out every day, weather dependent, to bring back home the food we love. And I think it was just an opportunity to sort of show them that we are so grateful, to give them thanks and praise and to really celebrate them. Jenny has made it her mission to give a voice to the hidden fisher folk of Britain, capturing the detail of their daily work, their passion and their massively important contribution to our economy. I asked her why, as British islanders, we're not a fish-eating culture. So you're absolutely right, Jilly. As an island nation, we actually export 80% of our British catch. And mainland Europe used to be our biggest market before Brexit. And often, if you're sat in a lovely restaurant on the coast of Spain or France, you are most probably tucking into British caught fish and seafood. And as an island nation, we really have to eat more fish and seafood. Um, and the only way I can understand why we don't is, is lack of education. I think people perhaps feel a little bit intimidated when f- cooking fish and seafood in the kitchen. Um, they don't quite know what to do with it, whereas, of course, keeping it as simple as possible is often the best answer. Um, and I think people just don't generally know enough about it. It's a fantastic source of nutrition. Fish and seafood is the second highest source of protein in the world of after cereals and grains. Um, and and it's, it's a fantastic sustainable food product and we just don't eat enough of it. You are absolutely bang on and it doesn't make any sense. We've always been an island nation. We haven't had a great food culture for a long time, but we did. And, you know, and fish has always been here and it's always been as simple as it is. I understand that we don't teach kids to cook uh, as well as we should. I understand that people don't you know hang around the kitchen as they should and watch parents cook because parents don't cook anymore i understand all of that stuff but with something as simple as a piece of cod baking it in the oven with a little bit of olive oil and maybe some red peppers something like that absolutely so this is your second book on fish and you know you talk to a lot of people in the business you must get a sense of what is the problem i think the problem is a multitude of different challenges um people when they talk about sustainable fish they don't often talk about the real issue which is sustainable fishing communities and there's a complete lack of food provenance and conversation and generally knowledge i think there's a whole generation that often actually think that not being able to cook is almost like a badge of honor um and i think you're right there's a whole generation of young children being brought up in the home where there's not an awful lot of home cooking and i think part of the issue is is that there's a lot of food poverty um and with the whole sort of government lobbying with like sugar and fats and processed food and the whole junk food scene there's you know fish and seafood is the best when it's caught fresh but there's also preserved alternatives such as preserved fish and seafood in tins um and i think there's an awful lot more that people can do and this country thrives upon charity and there's a fantastic charity that i'm supporting with the sales of my book for the love of the sea too called the food teacher center and, the- and we'll hear all about that in your fourth food moment and i totally get what you're saying i you know i work with the food foundation and we i make podcasts every single week about food poverty i understand the role of the food industry i understand the role of the government and i understand you know we we all know what is going on but actually that is thankfully a smallish percentage of the population what we're talking about is a whole nation that doesn't eat fish now what really is that about that's is it is it that we don't like it is it that we don't understand how the flavors work is it that we don't like the sliminess of it i think it's a combination of everything and it is just it always comes back to the same issue education 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 and just a lot of food provenance and information about where our fish and seafood generally comes from. I think as a human race, generally, we have become so disconnected from Mother Nature. We have become so disconnected from where our food comes from. We don't have the stories. We don't have the right questions to ask. 
other, unless you're a conscious consumer who is asking all the right questions. We're not buying local. We're not buying seasonally. We're not buying sustainably. We're not buying British. And all of these issues, it's a culmination of so much. It's such a delicate topic. I mean, where you come from is really important. And a lot of people live in cities. That's one of the big issues. You know, And that's one of the reasons that we lost our food culture back in the 1770s, when there was a massive sort of fleeing to the cities um, with the Enclosures Acts, uh, taking people away from the, the, their connection with the land. Just give us a little bit of background about where you grew up and why you do have this intense love of the sea. So I was brought up in towns and cities, and but we always used to make our annual pilgrimage to our holiday home in Sulcombe, um, which is always a very, very special place in my heart. Um, my great-great-grandfather built a house on the cliffs on, of East Portlemouth on the other side of the Sulcombe estuary, um, much to the disbelief from the local people. You can't build a house on the edge of a cliff. Um, but we've often, for six generations, have enjoyed all our holidays down on the sea. I learnt to crawl on Mill Bay. I got engaged on Maisley Cove. And it was very important to me to feature a fisherman from Sulcombe in my book. There are very far few between. Um, they are sort of um, not dying out, but there's only very few of them left. Um, and I think it's more important now than ever before to really support our fishermen and women. Um, and so the coast has always been um, a source of absolute joy, amazement and wonder, like for a lot of people. And I don't think you need to live by the coast to really enjoy the pull of the sea. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up all over the world. My father was in the army. so um, But we would always go down to see my grandparents in the Gower Peninsula. And that's where I learned my love of fish and crabbing and, and all those wonderful things that give you a real connection because it's about food memories, isn't it? The idea of the book is to take us into those little coves and meet the fishermen and find the people who actually make their livelihoods from this, this wonderful world that is so much part of your childhood and mine. Well, tell us about the idea behind that. Why did you want it to be a showcase for these people? How, how did you come up with that idea? So it was just a natural progression for my first book. And my background is having married a farmer. And I remember sitting at the seaside in Southwold, tucking into some fish and chips from the Seoul Bay Fish Company and thinking when people think about harvest, they automatically think about agriculture. They don't often think about the harvest of the sea. And I thought it would be a natural progression to continue celebrating our British food producers, especially all those people within our seafood community, fishermen and women, wholesalers, fishmongers, chefs and restaurateurs and so forth. And I just felt like it was just a natural progression for me to give them all a voice um, and it was really important for me to do as much research as possible and to really encapsulate the words that they use themselves from the heart to really convey where their food comes from. Yeah, you know, these are the people who you wouldn't really meet very often. They're the people behind the scenes, the, the people making the baskets. And we're going to meet some of them in your, in your food moments. It was very important, wasn't it, for you to be able to kind of take your reader with you down to the beaches, down to the, to the coves and, and find these people and let them tell their story. Uh, I mean, how important was it to literally get it from the fish's mouth, as it were? It is, that is the whole entire point of, of the book, is to really give them an opportunity to shout out to the world what they do, how they do it, why are they so passionate about what they do? And it's their livelihoods. This is their occupation, their living. And especially fishermen and women, it's the most dangerous peacetime occupation there is. They literally go out every day, weather dependent, to bring back home the food we love. And I think it was just an opportunity to sort of show them that we are so grateful, to give them thanks and praise and to really celebrate them because without them, there is no food. So let's meet some of them. Let's meet David C and Susan Morgan, the husband and wife team, in your first food moment. Yeah, so this sort of continues on from my real heartfelt special place that is Sulcombe. And David Morgan is the crab and lobster fisherman and his gorgeous wife, Susan, she's a lobster pot and crab pot maker and she weaves baskets, um, really interested in the social history and and the functional forms and the absolutely um, humbling craft um, that 
you know, is, is slowly dying out and she's re-encapsulated that passion and she's doing it herself for real. So David is a lobster and crab fisherman and then he's been doing that and they met each other on the beach in their teens and it's like a childhood sweetheart story. Um, and they've got, I think, six grandchildren, I think, so now. Um, and it's just really, really lovely and They go out every day to bring home the catch and uh, she contributed a recipe for lobster linguine and for the days when he's probably caught a surplus and she brings it home and and cooks up a lovely dinner for her friends and family. And it's just a really heartwarming, genuine family story of a family making a living from the sea. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of similar stories up and down the coast, which are very, very similar and as an island nation, as we touched on briefly before, I think we all have an individual responsibility to really encapsulate and bring life to this important, incredible heritage and tradition and culture in our social history of our fishing communities. It's a massive part of our food culture. It's a massive part of our history as a country. And I think if we were to eat more British fish and seafood, um, they will remain to be in existence it's about connection it's about connecting to your food culture eating to save the planet is about understanding where your food comes from and loving it absolutely but you know the second food moment is really interesting katish and rebecca larkham um they had to leave where they grew up and their life on the beach in order to understand the significance and the connection that they had with bivalves, another, the, the possibly the most sustainable food on the planet, and we've got masses of it. Tell us that story. So, Katish and Rebecca Larkham are twin sisters. Um, they grew up on the co- coast of Devon, um, and life took them in various different directions. But they ended up actually having a real passion for sharing the accessibility of what is seen as a luxury food item, such as mussels and bivalves and things like that, and oysters. And so they set up fishmongers and an oyster shucking business in the heart of London, in this lovely, very, very heartwarming pub um, called The Bird's Nest in the heart of London. And it's just something that you wouldn't automatically... um, have a vision for and I really admire the way they've set up a business in predominantly a male-dominated industry and they've really made it their own they've made it really accessible they've given a voice for other women in the industry and above all anything else they're just so adorable really lovely and really passionate and it's just a lovely simple story of two people who really want to make a living out of fish and seafood and they're just following their heart and doing doing what they love. They call themselves Sister Shuck. And what they talk about is really important. Tell us why bivalves are the most sustainable source of protein that we could possibly eat. So they grow naturally underwater and they are sustainable. And the problem is, is that with the export business with Brexit, because we do export so much of it to mainland Europe, because they're exported when they're alive, um, There are lots of challenges to get the live bivalves in good quality order when it reaches the other side. Um, And currently, Brexit issues are extremely challenging. And there's something like 170 different forms that have to be completed. And at the moment, the challenge is is to prevent them from dying and rotting in food vans waiting to cross the channel. Um, But that is completely regulated. I think there's a serial number for every single batch of live shellfish, which is brilliant because that gives some kind of regulation and it gives credibility to the source of where that food comes from um, and also gives a good reputation to the fishermen and where it was caught and it's got complete traceability so regulation is not a bad thing but at the moment there are lots of challenges to sort of export that that particular shellfish Um, but yes it is completely sustainable Um, they just grow on their own and um, and they prolifically it, prolifically and they are just completely sustainable um and sustainability you know it's all about ensuring that there are sufficient future stocks of particular food product for future generations to enjoy and it's obviously in the fishermen and women's best interests to ensure that they do fish sustainably to help encourage their communities to live future generations so it's a lovely story 
It is. And, and you know, mussels do not take from the sea. They only give to the sea. That's what it means with the sustainability. You know, the problem with food production is that it has the biggest impact of anything. But mussels, in fact, all bivalves, um, they are the future. We should be eating a lot of them and really encouraging that business. You you won the uh, Guild of Food Writers um, Award for Best Self-Published Book, didn't you? I I'm did. very interested in these self-published books. We do fight food writing retreats here and very often people come with a brand or a, a reason for writing a book that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, an outlet for their beautiful writing. Or they might just want to do it for whatever reason. And Meze Publishing is, is a very good example of, of how to do that. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll go on to your third food moment. Yes. Yeah, so I remember, like it was yesterday, pitching my idea to the director of Meze Publishing. And he was on board with it straight away. And it was incredibly exciting. I did go through a sort of inner turmoil thinking, um, thinking that I had an option to do it myself, to do my own photography, my own editing, sourcing everything, designing it. And I just quickly realised that, that was an absolutely massive challenge that I just wasn't capable of achieving. So I took a risk. I did invest a lot in, you know, in terms of finance to um, put up the production costs of the book. Um, but it was the best decision I've ever made. I have a fantastic team at my publisher um, who really helps support me and help marketing the book and getting the message out there. And it's been a fantastic, privileged journey to take the voices of all these different people um, and put them in the book. And what was really important to me was to have a good quality product to really kind of... Um, take advantage of these of these wonderful contributors and to do them proud. Yeah, I mean, I've spoken to many people who have self-published and it hasn't been that easy. Right. Um, Meze have a sort of a template to them. They have a format, don't they? And you can uh, you can pay a little amount of money and, and you do most of it. Mm. Uh, and you can pay a lot of the money and then you can do 50-50 or, or somewhere along the line. The point of it is that you come out with a book that looks like a very professional product and you can sell it yourself and it is up to you. So the more entrepreneurial right writers um, in the community may well choose that option. Publishers will immediately look at your Instagram following. Uh, they'll look at your age and they'll look <laughs> yeah. at your, you know, where you come from. And if you're not ticking the box for, for what they're looking for now, it's, it is really hard to get a publishing deal. So this is a strikeout for something that you can do absolutely on your own in the way that you want to. Um, Cornish Sea Salt is your third food moment largely because they do great stuff and I've got masses of them in my drawer yes. all different uh, flavours which is fantastic tell us about that well they sponsored um, the award at the Guild of Food Writers and I was very fortunate to meet them after accepting the award for my first sea book and I got a chat into them and they were started telling me their story about Cornish Sea Salt and uh, I just desperately wanted to include them in my sequel and they contributed their story um, and their recipe as well um, and I just absolutely love the way the world works sometimes with all these intrepid sort of connections and engagements and these impromptu meetings between people. And a lot of the stories within my books are often made by just doors opening and opportunities just facing themselves. And I, I think I've had a real lucky time in that whole journey. And I appreciate for some people it can be more challenging and more difficult. And it's a fantastic way to invest um, and to produce something that is a real passion project for most people. And the people who've contributed their stories, do they pay to go in the book? No, no. So I, so they don't pay anything to be in the book at all. It's me who's really contributed the, the major financial investment behind it. Um, and they obviously have a, an opportunity to buy the book at a lower price for them to have the opportunity to sell on. Um, and, I, and I'm very fortunate that all the books have been received so enthusiastically in both the agriculture and fishing industries. And to me, in publishing a book, um, that is the most important aspect for me. Yeah. Yeah. As is your fourth food moment, um, the Food Teachers Centre community. Now, this is the Fish Hero programme that you um, started talking about a little bit earlier. It's really important, this isn't it? I mean, I've done a, a, a lovely programme with chefs in schools, which is about teaching kids to not just to cook well, but actually to love food from the earliest. Tell us about the Fish Hero programme. So the Fish Hero programme are essentially food teachers who are trained to enable themselves to teach and go into secondary schools and teach children the nutritional value of fish and seafood and how to prepare fish and seafood to cook a lovely dish using fish. Um, and it's just 
encapsulates the most brilliant thing about this country, that we completely thrive off charity. And there's some amazing, inspiring, incredible people out there, especially our teachers, who are just quietly getting on with it, who are quietly educating the next generation. And I feel quite emotional, sorry. And um, it's just wonderful that these people are so passionate about teaching the next generation about fish and seafood. Um, and the Food Teachers Centre do all other things, but primarily their, their initiative is passing on that love and that respect for our food. There are around our island many, many communities that, uh, that are all about the fishing economy. I mean, tell us a little bit about how much in peril they are on their sea uh, because of a lack of buy-in, perhaps to encourage people to think twice about what they're going to eat tonight or at the weekend and to pop down and support their local fishmonger and think about supporting their, the nearest fishing community. Um, I can't stress the importance of buying local and really supporting our British food producers, especially both our farmers and fishermen, and to really support our fishmongers, our fish vans that visit farm shops on a weekly basis. And no matter where you live, whether it's in the city, on the coast, um, or town and country, or urban and rural, we, I think we all individually have a responsibility to shop more consciously and to consume ethically. We've all got an individual ethical responsibility to make conscious decisions for the better nature of our world and it's not nature versus nurture anymore it's nurturing that nature and and consuming responsibility um and i think there has to be a massive change in the food supply chain which is completely fragmented currently supermarkets are currently you know holding farmers and fishermen to ransom they're not giving the best price to the producer um and prices have come way down and it's just not sustainable. There's no longevity in that. Um, so an awful lot has to change. But I think we have a lot of power as a consumer to put our money where our hearts are um, and to really support our farmers and fishermen. Politically, we can continue writing out to our MPs to support, you know, a, a better food culture. But what about Brexit? Brexit has been absolutely appalling for fishermen. And we know that fishermen were a, a large community who voted for Brexit as well, as were farmers. Um, now that we, we know that it, it was a nightmare, that it was always going to be, is there anything that anybody can do? Um, I think the one thing that can change everything and I'm going to put myself out on the limb here, is to have a general election. Um, <laughs> I have the freedom to say that because I'm not sat at any table with great influence. And hand on heart, we just need new brains, better hearts at the top of the chain, at the top of the hierarchy that do have the responsibility to make that change and to make our lives significantly better because of Brexit and how distraught and how rubbish it's been the food producers generally in this country and perhaps all over the world have similar if not the same issues they've got the issues and the repercussions of both brexit and the pandemic they've got the rising cost of fuel and living costs the delicate hospitality trade which is under its own unique challenges and um, there are people who are literally losing their livelihoods because we've had a 14-year conservative government who have no compassion, no sense and sensibility, who are completely out of their depth, who have completely thrown agriculture and fishing industries under the bus. And that's not just my political opinion. That is fact. And I think the one way we can all help is by going to the ballot box and really making a difference and allowing another set of people to really come in and make a positive change. Thanks for listening. Do pop over to Substack where you'll find Jenny's Extra Bites, a template letter which you can send to your MP, which tells you all that they need to know about why they need to support the fishing industry. Do it! Get involved! We do have the power to change. Just search for Chilly Smith on Substack and I'll see you next week.